is Math 152. We're going to take a peek at the first part of Section 1.1 out of the Volume 2 book. The rest of the lectures will be out of that Volume 2 book. So um, we're going to talk about a way of notating repeated addition. So for example, if I had 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus keep going, 5, 6, 7, 8, blah, 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 all the way up to plus 50, there's a shorthand for that, uh, which we call sigma notation. And the sigma is uh, a letter from the Greek alphabet that I'm trying to write, sigma. I'm going to try to write it a little neater. And we can say, uh, if I wanted to write this, I'm going to eyes my variable. So I'm going to start at 1, and I'm going to go to 50. So this is my start down here. This is my finish up here. And then what do you do to i each time? You just say, just let it be i. So notice that this what, what this tells us to do is take i, uh, take 1, plug it in. So write that down. Then add the next thing. What's after 1? 2. And keep doing that all the way up to 50. So sometimes, um, sometimes this will get written something. I'm going to just say something, something. It might be written as like a sub i that, or, or some function relative to i. And this doesn't have to be an i. You could make this uh, a j or whatever. But this could be some function. Just real quick, again, this is the start. Uh, this is the finish. It just increases by one each time. And then this is the function. So if I wrote something like, I is going to start at 1 all the way up to 5, and my function is 1 over i squared. So in the sigma notation, this is a summation. It's telling me to add a bunch of terms together. And the way that I generate the terms is I start at the start. So i is 1, so I plug in 1. 1 over 1 squared is 1. Plus, now I plug in 2. 1 over 2 squared is 4. That was 2. Now plug in 3. 1 over 3 squared is 9. Now plug in 4, and you keep doing this until you hit the end point. Uh, plug in 5. 5 is the end point, so I'm going to include it. 5 squared is 25. And then I would perform that addition to get the answer. Right? Like this resolves to, uh, to a number. Uh, if I had one that was sum from 3 to 6, 2 to the i power. Notice that what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at 3. And I'm going to plug it in. So 2 to the 3rd plus, and I'm just going to keep increasing this by 1 until I get up to 6. 2 to the 4th, 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 6th. Shove them into a calculator, something like that, add them all together. I'm there. So that's how sigma notation works. It's a summation. So being familiar with sigma notation uh, is one of the pieces for this, for this section. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, of things that you I'd like for you to know about sigma notation. So these, these will be some properties. If I'm going um, from 1 to some value of a constant, so for example, if I was saying start at 1, go up to 10, and it's just 5. Notice there's no i there. This is just like I'm just going 5. So if when i is 1, 5 is 5. So this would be 5 when i is 1, 5 when i is 2, 5 when i is 3, all the way up to 10 of them. So notice I would just have 10 5s. So that would be 50. So this is just where we end times that constant. So if I'm summing a constant, it's just like multiplying, right? Because I'm adding it to itself that many times. All right, if I have some constant times the function, uh, times some function, right, like i squared or whatever it is, I can bring that out and still sum up whatever this is. And this a sub i is just a way to say the ith term in whatever a is, whatever that sequence is. Um, if I'm adding or subtracting, I can split it up. So here's what I here's what I mean by that. Something plus something else. That's the same as them split up. I could do them separately. Right, like I could take the summation of the first one plus the summation of the second one. And that works for subtraction too. So if it's minus, it could be minus as well. And the last thing I want to throw at you, uh, just property relationship wise, is you can split this 
up one to n. So like what I mean is I just have it running from one to n for some function. Let's assume that there's some m value between one and n. I could go like go from one to m, do that part, and then I could do it from that to there. So for example, like if this was running from one to ten, I could say uh, one to seven and then pick up the rest of it eight to ten. And since it's addition, I could just do like the little chunks and then throw them together. So you can split it up as well. So there's a couple formulas that you should know, and I'll I'll get them written written up. So here they are. Uh, this is just the sum if you're just summing i. So this would just be like one plus two plus three plus four, all the way up to n. You're just subbing, uh, sorry, summing those consecutive numbers. You can plug this in. You can plug your n into value to that and get it. Um, I'll do some examples of here in a second. If you're summing squares, so, so for example, one plus two squared plus four plus three squared, uh, sorry, nine plus four squared, uh, 16, all the way up to n squared, you can plug it into this formula and I'll give it to you. And if you're doing cubes, you can plug it into this. So like one plus two cubed plus three cubed all the way up to n cubed. So we have these formulas that we can, uh, we can figure values for. So for example, if I was like, I want to sum up all the squares from one to 10, Instead of writing them all out, one squared plus two squared plus all the way up, I can use this formula for squaring. So n is 10, so it would be 10 uh, times 11 times plug in 10, 21 over six, and then you'd evaluate that and that would give you the, the number for it. So knowing these is kind of, uh, kind of great because like let's say I had to sum up something like the values from one, and I'll use k here, from 1 to 50 of uh, 2 squared, k squared minus 5k plus 1. It's a bit of work, like plug 1 into this, evaluate it. Plug 2 into this, evaluate it. Plug 3 into this, evaluate it. Keep doing that all the way up to 50 and then add all those pieces together. Substantial amount of work. So I'm going to take advantage of both these properties that we mentioned earlier, and these formulas. So I know that I could do each of these individually because they're just plus minus. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna write some stuff out. All right, so I've got those. Now, the other thing I know, I can, I can break that up. The other thing I know is I can bring these multipliers out, right? Like C times whatever the function is, is C times the summation of the function. So I could say that this would be the same as two times that, and this would be the same as five times that, and that's a one. And so now I have two times whatever this is, this k squared. We'll look up here. I can plug 50 in, so that's two times whatever this is. 50 times 51 times 101 over six, minus five times the summation just to k, that's this one, so 50, times 51 over two, plus this is just a constant. That goes back to this one. The constant is just how many times you've added it times it. So 50 times one. Shove that into my calculator, beep, bop, boop, and I've got that, uh, I've got that calculated. It's a beautiful thing. All right, two different ideas that I want to consider here. Well, same idea, two examples. Well, first I'm going to use sigma notation to find the sum of this for i taking on all of these values, 1, 2, all the way up to 200. So i is going to start at 1. It's going to end at 200. And it's going to get plugged into this function, uh, i minus 3 squared. And now if I actually wanted to evaluate this, um, you know what I think I'll do is multiply this out. If I square that, that's the same as i squared minus 6i plus 9. And then it's just like the problem we did before. We're going to split it into three pieces. 
and use those, uh, those formulas that are up here to help us find them. If I want to write this one in sigma notation, i starting at 1, it's going all the way up to 6, and it's of i cubed minus i squared. Again, I can split this into two different ones, the i cubed and the i squared, and I can subtract using those, those formulas that are up here, the sum of squares and sum of cubes formulas. So now I'm going to talk about an idea that's going to feel a little disjointed, but next lecture we'll, we'll, we'll get them together. We'll get them more connected. And this is how do we approximate area under a curve. And you'll see that we'll be adding stuff together. So for example, let's say that I wanted uh, from one to five, right? Like my interval is gonna be from one to five. And notice this is interval notation. It's talking about X values from one to five. And I wanted to know about what is the area under this curve? What is this area under here? So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna approximate it using some, some rectangles. So in other words, I could split it up into however many pieces I want, how many rectangles I want. Um, like if I just did this into two rectangles, I would say n equals two. So I would go like halfway between these is three. So I could make a rectangle here. And notice I'm just touching it and a rectangle here. So notice I could get this value right here by going, what is this function at one, right? Like that gives me that value. This with this two, and then I could say I could get this height by going what is this function at three, and then this with this two again. So I go um, whatever f of one is times two. That's the area of this plus whatever f of three is times two. That's the area of that, and it give me an approximation. It'd be off, right? It'd be way low, but it would give me approximation for it. And what, I, what I'm doing here is, is called a left-handed or a left-sided um, approximation, right? Because I'm taking these. If I did a right-hand approximation from the same, I'm still gonna split it, since n is two, I'm still gonna split it into these distances of two. Notice I could get that. How far is it from five to one divided by how many intervals I want? But if I do the right-hand side, then I do it here, and here, this is still a value of F3, so the area of this one would be F of three times two. It's just height times width, right? The height is F of three, and the width is two, plus uh, this would be F of five times two. And then I would add those together. That would be a right-hand approximation. And notice in this case, that's a little, little much. It's a little steep. That's the basic idea between this. And if, I, if, if that wasn't exact enough, how about I say instead of n being 2, I let n be 4, which means I'm going to do it with four rectangles. So let me think about this. The distance from 5 to 1 is 4. If I split that into four pieces, those widths are going to be 1 in each case. So one of my rectangles be here. You know, those are the bases of those rectangles. And then if I do left-hand approximation, it's going to look like this. And in this case, that's going to be a little low. And if I do right-hand approximations, like this. And in this case, uh, that's going to be a little high. So that's our basic idea for, uh, for estimating. I would say that this illustrates a right-hand approximation where n is 4, with 4 rectangles. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Okay, so now let's get some actual values out of this. Let's let's actually do it. So I'm going to change up our function a little bit. I've been dragging this function around all lecture. Let's let's mess mess with it and see what we can get. Okay, uh, this is a function. This is a graph of x squared plus three. And let's evaluate it from three to fifteen. And let's just do a couple of different. Uh, version so we get a feel for it. So there's my function, and I want to do it from 3 to 15. So I'm going to run it from 3 to 15. So what I'm trying to find is an approximation of all this area under this curve. And I'm not getting it exactly, it's just an approximation. 
So let's do uh, a version that we'll call L2. So N is two, so we're gonna have two pieces, uh, two rectangles, and we're gonna do it on the, from the left-hand side. So let me think about this, 15 to three, that distance, uh, I'll, how long that is, I could say that's 15 minus three, and I'm gonna split that into two pieces. So 15 minus three is 12, 12 divided by two is six. So my bases are gonna be six long. So I'm gonna go from three to nine, and nine to 15, right? These are sixes. This is like my change in X is six in this case. And if I do a left-hand approximation, that means I'm gonna get to here, and then I'm gonna get to here. And you can tell that's gonna be way low, but let me calculate how I'm going to find this. So first off, I have a base of six, and then my height is what this function is equal to when x is three. Like, if I wanna know what that actual height is, I'm just gonna go uh, f of three. Sorry. I'm gonna go f of three times six. Notice that gives me the area of this rectangle. And then f of nine, that's this height. And hopefully you see what we're doing is we're, we're repeatedly summing something. This next lecture will start to connect this back to that summation work that we were doing. So f of three, uh, if I plug in three into here, three squared plus three is 12. So 12 plus if I plug in nine, uh, 81 plus three, I think that's 84. And if I shove that into my calculator, I get a uh, 546, nope, 576. So my evaluation of two gives me 576. And I can tell that's that's pretty uh, woeful. Like that's that's off by quite a bit. Well, let me do uh, let me do another one. Let me do an L4 and see how what that's going to be. So again, I'm running from three to 15. That was given to me that interval. And so now I'm going to do it in four pieces. So uh, the length of my interval will, you know, my, each of the bases of the rectangles will be 15 minus 3 divided by 4, and uh, that's 3. So each of these bases will be 3 long, so 6, 9, 12. So notice what I've got is I've got, like, where I started, and then to get to the next one, I'm adding that change in x. Right, this is my this is my change in x essentially, and then I add change in x again, add change in x again, and if I do a left hand approximation, I'm going to have these rectangles. So notice these bases are all three, and then my height my height here is f of three again. My height here is f of six, f of nine f of 12. So really, I'm going to go uh, whatever f of 3 is times 3, right? Base times height, or height times base, plus whatever f of 6 is, is 6 is <laughs> times 3, plus whatever f of 9 is times 3, plus whatever f of 12 is times 3. Uh, repeatedly, you know, I'm going to have to do a lot of calculation here. Do that a bunch of times. I'm going to end up with uh, 846. And you can tell that's a better approximation, right? Like it's it's all closer to it. Let me do one more here. I'm just going to do a right-hand one. So same idea, but I'm going to do a right-hand approximation with four subdivisions. Again, uh, 15 minus 3 divided by 4. That's three, so I know that each of my bases are gonna be three. But now if I'm gonna go right-hand, I start with these, these right-hand lines. These are the ones I'm gonna make my rectangles off of. And again, straight across. And you can tell this one's gonna be a little, in this case, it's gonna be a little big for an approximation. So my height here on this first rectangle, it doesn't look like much of a rectangle. I should have drawn it better. Doesn't look it much better, does it? Pretend like this is flat, there you go. Uh, f of 6, there you go, I should say there I go, f of 9, f of 12, 
So notice we started at 3 plus the change in x, right? We didn't start at 3, the first part of the interval. We started at the right-hand side of it. So if I did this one out, it's going to be that height times the base, that's the area of this one, plus that height times that base. Base is always the same in this, in this method. That height times that base, that height times that base. Calculate all of these, f of 6, right? Plug in 6, 36 plus 3 is 39. Multiply them all out. And if I do this one, I'm going to get 1490. So notice that is going to be a little bit big. But I think you can kind of see where we're going. We know the actual, um, the actual has to be between these two. And next time we'll talk about, like, if we want to be more accurate, then maybe what we could do is make this number bigger, the number of partitions bigger. And what are implications for that? All right. Hey, give those uh, problems in the homework set a try. Post any questions or message me with any questions that you have.